All right, we're recording. Do I need okay, to we are live. Else from you, Justin? All right. Nope, we're good. Um, Jane, you're on with roll call. All right, welcome to the July 21st Park and Recreation Advisory Commission meeting. Pam Weil. Present in Ingham County, City of East Lansing. Chuck Overby. Present, Ingham County, City of East Lansing. Alex Smith. Adam DeLay. Present, attending virtually from the City of East Lansing in Ingham County. Sarah Hoover. Present, I am in Clinton County, City of East Lansing. Nicole Biber. Here I am. I am in East Lansing in Ingham County. And Sarah Reckow. Present, City of East Lansing in Ingham County. All right, thank you. All right, approval of the agenda. Does someone want to move it? Pam, I would, I would like to suggest that we add an additional item. I think, Chuck, we need to move it and then we'll get your addition and then we'll vote on that change and move it with your change. Okay. Okay, so, do we have someone to move it? So moved. Yeah. Okay. Um, second? And what we'll get yours second. in before the vote. Okay. okay. And so now, Chuck, you have an amendment to the agenda? I do. I would, I would like to add a, a discussion item on the... Um, the, the meeting of the of the commissioners with the parks and recreation director candidates. Okay, and so where where would we like to insert that? Uh, that's, Wendy, uh, do you have a preference? Um, no, no, I don't. I was going to provide um, some additional information during the director's report, but you could add this just as a. Um, you could add it just as one of your business items right after the parks project update, if you like. Okay, 3.3. And that would be a discussion around the role of the parks commissioners in the, the hiring of the director process? Correct. Okay. Um, does someone want to support that amendment? I'll support. I'll support it. Oh. <laughs> I've okay. always been quick on the raising hand draw. <laughs> All those in favor of the modified agenda with the addition of a 3.3 item around the role of the commissioners in hiring the new parks director, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Hearing none, the modified agenda passes. All right. Approval of June six, the June sixteenth minutes. Someone want to move those? So moved. Second. And a quick right. question on those, just sure. to be specific. Um, it says <clears throat> when I was I rewatched the meeting, and it says in the minutes here that I was selected to do the um, interviews for the director's position, but if I recall. Um, that was not my, I wasn't discussed as being in the, on that panel in the meeting. I believe that was done subsequently via email. So I know I'm being a stickler there, but I don't know if like that wasn't something that was discussed in the meeting. I was not selected for that panel at the meeting. So I know that's being very particular, but just something I wanted to put out there in case folks had a, you know, felt that needed to be changed. Adam, do you want to do it? Sure, I'll make an I'll make an amendment to the minutes that um, strikes my name um, as being because I know when I rewatched it it was it was Pam Chuck and then Sarah as an alternate, um, but just striking my name out of there I was added subsequently after an email conversation so just making that change. That I hear that Adam and I do love having the recorded meetings so much. Um, how I don't remember how that happened because we have three slots. So did we already know when we went through the meeting that that we have, <clears throat> that we need, I know we needed an alternate. I thought we had four volunteers. Oh, Wendy? 
My my memory and Adam, it sounds like you listened to the meeting. My memory is that um, as Sarah had suggested she could be available depending on her schedule. And then it was mentioned that, um, and I'm not sure which commissioner mentioned it, that um, they thought Adam would have an interest as well. And so the my understanding was the discussion was that someone would reach out to Adam to see if he was interested and that Sarah would would be the alternate um, if needed. That was my okay. memory. Yeah, that sounds right. So it sounds like we knew going into the meet in the meeting, we knew you were interested in being on it. And we discussed as if you were, does that sound right, Chuck? Are you having? Well, I'm, I, I'm thinking we should let Adam speak for himself. Well, I, all there. I will say is, I, I, all I will say is I actually watched it this afternoon in preparation for this one. And um, the discussion centered around Chuck, Pam, Sarah, and then Nicole had expressed some interest, but then ultimately decided um, that she wasn't interested. And then it said, okay, well, we'll kind of move forward from there and, and kind of go from there. So I, there was no, in that meeting, selection of myself. Um, I think Chuck had said, well, I know Adam's not here. He might be interested. We'll, we'll follow up with them. And then I cannot recall if it was either before the meeting or after the meeting that someone reached out to me via email. Um, you know, again, I, I, I'm being a stickler on it, but I, I, I can say that when I watched it this afternoon, I, I wasn't, there wasn't a, my name was not one that was put down as of that meeting. So, okay. you know, in terms of crossing the T's and dotting the I's, you know, it looks like that yeah. was a selection that was made later. Yeah, and I actually just captured that section for the minutes too, because I'm like, oh, let's move that forward in this discussion. So, yeah, I, I okay. So we are talking about modifying the minutes to represent Adam's um, description of what happened, that it was the, 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 um, Delay on the committee and Rackow as an alternate was determined post meeting. Sure. Through email right. So I think your minutes just say that um, Chuck Overby and um, you know the chairperson um, would sit on the committee. Sarah would serve as an alternate, and um, you know someone would reach out to add Adam Delay to uh, gauge his interest. No, I think it. No, but I think it does say because I I captured it while over B and Delay were selected with Commissioner Rakow as the alternate. That, I mean, that's what the, the minutes say. That is that is correct. We will need to make an adjustment yeah. to yeah. the minutes to say yeah. that um, while and over B were selected with Rakow as an alternate, um, with further discussion to be had with Delay. Perfect. Right. Perfect. Thank you. That sound, does that sound good? So moved. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now we vote on the amended minutes and and uh, vote to approve the minutes as amended. Say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed, say nay. Hearing none, they pass with the modifications discussed. Thank you all. Oh, all right. Yeah, thanks for that, Adam. I you know, that. like I said, it's, it's you know, I'm, uh, I'm you know, I'm no, minutes sometimes. have meaning. Minutes that's right. create yes. reality. Yes. So, and that's why I love having the tape meetings. But minutes really create reality because when you go back, if it's not in the meetings it, or in the minutes, it didn't happen. Right. Cool. Well, I appreciate that, everyone. Yeah. Uh, I Justin? just knew that. At, I just knew Adam was going to step forward and do it. So I just, you know, <laughs> there you I go. took the yes. liberty of assuming. Yes. <laughs> Luckily, you were correct, Jake. There you go. <laughs> Okay. Um, Justin, do we have any public comment today? Yes, we do. Caller ending in phone number 534. You may address the commission. Again, that's phone number ending in 534. Please dial star six to unmute and address the commission. Hi, this is Ann Hill at 685 Luteo. Uh, speaking of the uh, minutes and the ability or the recording and the ability to be able to go back and listen to it. I think it's a great thing. Um, I would just let you know that when I tried to log in today, um, I'm on the, I can see on the Zoom everything that's going on. However, there's no audio coming from it. 
uh, which is why I decided to phone in as well. Uh, but you might want to check and see if there is an issue with the audio, because normally I don't have this problem. And other than that, I don't have any comments. All right. Well, thanks for the update. I will verify that right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Justin, let us know what you find. So we've got that in the in the record. All right, business item. School age care program present. Oh, do we have any more public comment? No, we do not. Okay, um, so 3.1 school age care program presentation. Um, Pam, if okay. you wouldn't mind, I'll give a brief introduction to um, our staff person is here. Um, we have Julianne Jennings here with us tonight, and she's going to share some information with you about our school age child care program. That includes the before and after school program, as well as summer camps. Um, Julianne has worked with the city um, for even even longer than I, which says a lot. Um, she came to the city through East Lansing Recreation and Arts or ELRA. For those of you who were around the city um, oh, 20 years ago, recreation and arts programming used to be provided by a um, independent nonprofit, East Lansing Recreation and Arts. And they um, operated out of the Bailey Community Center and offered all of the recreation and arts programming. In 2002, um, Island, the ELRA um, disbanded, ceased to exist, and the city took over all recreation programming, including all the staff. And Julie joined us from that program, as well as all of her staff. And she's been with the, the city since then and has, you know, ridden with us on some pretty rough roads, but I think we're in a real good spot now. And she's going to share with you about our program program offerings at this point in time, including some information about the wonderful things we did um, during the COVID pandemic to support our residents um, who um, were also attempting to raise children during that time. So um, Julianne. So oh, yes, um, I did a PowerPoint um, presentation, um, or shall I say slides for you guys to see, and Justin looks like he's sharing that right now. Um, Justin, is will it, um, do I just tell you that I need it to advance? Is that how that works? Yes, just tell me when you're ready for the next slide. Um, and right. also while I'm speaking, I will verify that I tested on two other devices that the YouTube stream does have audio. Um, so it does appear to be working on multiple devices for the public I, to observe. Probably isn't helping because she can't hear us, but I had to switch my um, speaker setting on my computer when I got in, just FYI. So she may want to look at her speaker setting because I have multiple oh. speaker choices. Hopefully she has the closed captioning on. Uh, yeah, good. At, yes, hopefully. That's good. Yeah. So as Wendy said, um, I am the coordinator for the school age care programs. Um, and I have an assistant specialist, which is Bethany Ross, and then Lois Fogarcy, who also works at the um, um, Hannah Community Center is our accounts manager. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have our before and after school care programs. Um, this year, we will um, be opening up in six elementary schools since the East Lansing Public Schools have now completed all six um, buildings. Um, when Marble is uh, opening um, at the end of August. And we lease space um, every year from the public school district. So we pay them four spaces in their buildings so that we can run the before and after school program. Our before and after school program is open from seven until the start of the school day. And then from dismissal of the school day to 545 each evening. And we are open for full days during our winter break and spring break, and those things are held at the Hannah Community Center. But the population that uses winter break and spring break are typically those 
that are from the East Lansing Public School BNA program. In the summer, we do kids camp June through August, depending on the um, amount of summer weeks that we have in our school calendar. Um, it's anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks each summer. Um, and that operates at the East Lansing Hanna Community Center. Next slide. We have um, a philosophy with our kids and our staff um, to provide a safe and friendly caring environment for kids for those out of school time um, activities. We want the children to um, foster friendships with each other, um, have positive peer interactions, um, gross motor activities. We are allowed to use the gym spaces and the outdoor um, playgrounds at each of the elementary schools. And when we're in the full day cares over at Hannah, we use the gym in our break cares. And then we use the outside green space when the weather allows, especially in the summer camp programs. We try to create a healthy lifestyle with the kids and we foster um, self-esteem building and confidence through our activities and things that we um, program for the children. Next slide. I am a elementary education major and a child psychology psychologist. Um, I have a degree in bachelor's in both. And I um, also my uh, Bethany Ross, who works with us is a child development um, major. She has a bachelor's in child development. And we totally agree that children learn through play and our program, um, we can touch on the four different donate domains of a child with a cognitive development, physical development, social development, emotional development. And in our before and after school programming and in our summer camp programming, we use play and our activities to create these this um, development for children. So we incorporate group games, we incorporate gym time and playground time, um, in our summer camps, we have story times. Uh, we do homework help throughout the school year um, with write, reading and writing and math. We have speakers that come in and do science and special events with the kids. We try to encourage the kids to um, improve their self-help skills and to express their feelings in a safe spot. We celebrate successes and we try to have them problem solve when they're having issues or have them try to learn about sharing and collaborative games and taking turns, all of those things that you would want um, your child to move through um, and develop in a positive way. Next slide, please. Ratios and licensing. Our state license for the summer camp program we have to renew these every two years and um, the state requires a one to 10 ratio of adults to children or campers in the summer. We try to um, be really close to that ratio, but on field trips, we're at more of a one to eight uh, ratio. We have not been able to go on field trips for the past two years um, due to COVID. However, we're hoping that in the 22 summer summer, we will be able to add those back into our curriculum. Our before and after school ratios are one adult to 18. However, we maintain a one to 12 at those before and after school sites in the buildings. Our license for the Hanna Community Center is um, 100 children a day um, for those 10 weeks. And it's usually broken up into four classrooms with 25 children um, grade specific um, classrooms in that building. Starting this year, all of our before and after school sites will be at a ratio of 72 per building, which is really nice. They have, uh, with the upgrades that they have made in our um, elementary schools, we have been able to. Um, hopefully not have a waiting list anymore. Um, in the past, our uh, capacity is based on the square footage of the multi-purpose room, the gym, um, 
in those buildings. And now with this, the new buildings, they have a pretty big cafeteria, multi-purpose room, and their gyms are um, new and a lot bigger. So we were able to license the buildings for 72 students um, each day. Um, but uh, but prior to that, we were anywhere between 50 and 60. Um, let's see. We have approximately 30 staff working in our summer camp on a regular summer. This year, I only have 12 staff working. Um, and in the before and after school programs at each site, we have one site leader and two to three aides um, between the AMs and the PMs based on ratios. Next slide, please. All of our staff have to go through trainings each year in first aid, CPR, bloodborne pathogens, um, and state, state licensing protocols. In actuality, this last year and a half, we have been training pretty much nonstop because they keep adjusting the CDC guidelines and all of our COVID protocols for our state licenses. So we've been training and then retraining. Uh, the staff members have to have 16 clock hours each year for the before and after school program. And then if they continue through the summer, we need to do 30 hours of training prior to summer camp, which goes over our curriculum. It goes over the licensing things and changes that happen for that, that uh, summer, as well as child development training and um, activity trainings, gross motor trainings, things like that. And up until this year, most of our staff has been through education, child development, kinesiology majors, nursing, social work, engineering, and parks and rec. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the students will come back to school uh, at MSU and uh, would like to have a job. <laughs> so that's where we're at right now. We're trying to uh, get staff ready for the fall. We are currently under a staffing shortage. Um, at the moment for our programs. Next slide, please. This is just a slide of our rates and fees. They have been pretty consistent over the last um, five or six years. There is a, um, the registration fee is always $50 each year and for summer it's 30. Um, our before and after, our before school times, the six and the five are, have been consistent for the last 10 years. Late starts just happened two years ago in the school district, so we had to create a spot for that. And that is when the um, teachers have professional development in the morning. And so we watch the kids from 7 to 11.30 until um, their staff um, return to their buildings to start their school day. We also do after school um, care and our half days are when the schools, um, the children get dismissed at 12 o'clock and we watch them on site until 5.45. Next slide. Well, due to COVID, we've had to create a lot of different changes in our programs um, so that we could open up for the essential workers and for um, parents that had to go back to school. So we had to implement these changes um, based on our licensing for these centers. We have, we currently, and started back in July of 2020, we had to take temperatures of staff and children daily. We had to pick up and drop off, parents had to pick up and drop off children curbside. So we would walk out and meet the cars and um, escort the kids into their pods. The children and the staff all still continue to wear masks or facial coverings throughout the day, except for when they're eating and or drinking and swimming. We have collected lots of art supplies and individual art supplies. So each child has their own crafts and supplies and art material bags. And we also have increased our hand washing and sanitizing of, of high touch services throughout the day. The children have to wash their hands when they enter the program. They have to wash their hands prior to going um, 
out onto the playground once they return from the playground. So everybody sort of has a, um, a new way of keeping their hands and surfaces cleaner. And we have created barriers on our tabletops um, when six feet of distance is not achievable. For example, when they are doing, um, trying to do not necessarily parallel play, but cooperative play. You're trying to give them each some Legos, but you want them not to have to be playing by themselves. So we have tabletop barriers and things like that to assist in that. Next slide, please. So this is a little breakdown of the pandemic timeline. In March of 2020, we closed our before and after school sites at our um, elementary schools, and we had to refund all of our participants for the end of March, April, May, and June. In June of 2020, we started our staff training. A lot of that was online. Um, our staff went through tons of webinars and our countless hours of trying to figure out what did this pandemic mean to us and mean to the families in our care. We had to um, put one-way signage, shields and barriers, hand sanitizing stations. Um, as I talked about before, we had to do grade specific um, pods and temperature taking. So we had to get all of that ready for the children so that we could attempt to open for summer camp in July of 2020. We opened up four classrooms at kids camp for that, that summer. And mostly the, the, we had 24 to 30 kids in different pods. And it was based on parents that were, were essential workers or that had to go back to work. And that was pretty much who our summer camp group, groupings were. Um, and then in September, we continued those pods and we started remote, remote learning pods. And what that meant was to us, all of the kids that were enrolled in the East Lansing Public Schools would bring their um, electronic device that they had been issued by the school district. And we would, as staff, log them in, sit with them, help them with their assignments, help them um, get on to their meetings and do homework and things like that throughout from September all the way through March 2021. So we had four different um, pods and an extra classroom where kids that had to do specific for example, we had one room that was um, our music room. So when they were on with music, we had all the, you know, when they'd go over there, they'd take their device over there and then they, you'd hear them singing and dancing in, in, the, in the room over there. We had to make um, boxes of stuff for their uh, gross motor gym activities. And so when they were doing gym, we had, that we had all these boxes where they would just get their supplies and then they'd go do that um, while they're watching it on, uh, online with their with their teacher and instructor. So we accomplished that pretty well for that group of children that uh, wanted to participate. And then in March, when the some of the parents had chosen to go back to in person learning, we opened up the before and after school programs again at uh, three different schools. And we kept a remote learning pod open through the end of the um, spring break until after spring break um, so that some children that chose not to go back to in-person right away had that opportunity to stay with us on, for another month. And the before and after school programs, when we were used to 50 or 60 kids an afternoon and you only have 10 to 12 was a very big difference for us. Um, and it was a very big difference for the kids themselves. Um, staff wise, it was just a little bit, it just felt a little bit different for us. This summer, however, we did get to open back up our kids camp and we have had 45 to 60 kids a day at our kids camp and things are starting to open up a little bit better. They got to go swimming this year, which we could not do last year. We still did not go on any field trips, but we were able to have uh, guest speakers again this year that came in and did some fun things with our kids and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the before and after school program, like I said, operates from seven to start a school and from dismissal of school to 545. They, the children come in, they get signed in and uh, based on their schedule, we have board games and puzzles, arts and crafts, uh, gross motor STEM learning, those type of things. We also do homework assistance, social emotional learning and uh, socialization just so they have some other kids to play with. Next slide, please. These are our six sites for this, this school year. And this is our enrollment um, based on prior years in 2018 and 19. Donnelly had uh, 50 children enrolled in 1920. Prior to the pandemic, we had 52. And then this school year, we ended up having to um, combine the marble and the Donnelly buildings. Um, we had 19 enrolled um, for the end of this school year. And uh, we operated out of the new Donnelly building. Um, Marble actually was in the old Donnelly building, which was all up on the same, um, same piece of property up there. So we walked the kids back and forth from those two schools. Glen Karen was up at 79 and 18. Then we last year, uh, prior to the pandemic, we had 98 children enrolled in that school. And um, during the pandemic, we had 16. Um, you can see that Marble was at 96 both years prior to the pandemic. And then as we talked about, Marble was at Old Donnelly last year. Um, Pinecrest was at 97 and 81 with 14 enrolled on that site over there. And Red Cedar for the last three years has been the transition school for the school district. So. In 18 and 19, Glen Karen was actually operating out of Red Cedar. And then in the 1920 school year, Pinecrest children were operating out of Red Cedar. And then this, this year, the 2021 year, when we came back for those four months, our Red Cedar kids joined Glen Karen, um, that population. So that's that group of 16, which was Glen Karen and Red Cedar kids combined. Julianne, can I ask a question? Yes. Why, why are Donnelly's numbers so small historically? Is it a smaller school? Correct. It, it is a smaller grouping of, of, of uh, the way the district is set, set up over there. And um, we've, uh, that's why we've always, we've never had a wait list at Donnelly up there at all. We've had, as you can see, Marble and Pinecrest have, all, have always um, hit a wait list for us. Um, I think that this will change um, this year for sure due to the fact that um, with us having 72 spaces in those, those areas, first of all, but second of all, now that everybody's going back to their home schools um, because they're not in construction anymore that, and, and their neighborhoods are back, I think they've redistricted it enough that I think we will be pretty much even across the board now. But a lot of times um, the permeal boundary that they allow the students to do um, changes our numbers um, for uh, and school of choice. They've done a lot more school of choice into Glen Karen um, and Pinecrest, probably due to the fact that they're on the closer side to the Lansing. And so a lot more uh, school of choice have chosen to go into those two buildings at that time. Next slide, please. Um, actually, I, I want to bring something up here just to um, make, make sure this is really clear. Um, I, I'm sure you all caught in those last two slides the incredible amount of changes and adjustments that had to happen in the before and after school program over the course of the pandemic. And those adjustments included were, were really driven by um, doing everything we could to serve the needs of the families whose, whose children are in our care. And so, um, but then you look at this second slide and you realize even before the pandemic, with the way that the school district has been implementing the changes in their schools, they are moving children from site to site as new schools are being constructed, 
each time a move like that happens, there needs to be relicensing, there needs to be a readjustment in staff, some additional training. So the lift that our, that our child care staff have done over these last three years has been incredible. And I just really wanna want to stress that and, and call to everybody's attention. This has been a continual process the last three years, uh, even before the pandemic. And our staff have never stopped. And they're, oh, go ahead, sir. they're just continuing to adjust to the needs of the residents and the needs of the school district. And um, they're, they're doing an, an amazing job at that. So yeah. I just yeah. wanted to make sure to call that out. Here, here, I totally support that. And I also point out how challenge, this is all administrative. This isn't even about anything that goes with your degree. <laughs> It's not about it's not about the kids. It's managing facilities and administrative work. And so kudos to that because that is, you know, a lot of times that is just the whole extra layer. It's like a whole other job. <laughs> so very impressive. Nice, nice, nicely handled. Thank you. Next slide. So as we've talked about the winter break and spring break. Um, we do the 7.30 to 5.30 in the Hanna Community Center and arts and crafts, science project, guest speakers, gym and swimming. And then summer camp, we usually use three classrooms, 144, 211, and 235. This year we're using the recital room um, because we needed to have more spaces with less kids in them um, for our pods. Our remote learning also when we were creating our remote learning pods, we had to think about who was going back to what schools and was going to want to be in before and after scare school when they returned. So our pods were White Hills kids in certain grades, and then you'd have Pinecrest kids in certain grades, because that way we had less contacts um, for those kids um, when they were returning, they'd be returning back to their school population and be with the same kids that they were with us for remote learning. So summer kids camp, um, we also are do, we do mostly, um, we break them up by grade in the summer. We have a first grade group. We usually have our second and third graders combined and then our fourth and fifth graders are combined. And we do arts and crafts, educational experiences, guest speakers. We go to the library every week and we get to this year, we get to use the indoor swimming pool. In the past, we've been able to use the um, outdoor pool as well. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the things that we do with the kids during the full days of fun um, during the school year and in the summer. Next slide, please. So break care is a um, extension of our before and after school program. And we typically have 45 children um, average per day. Um, these are 2017, 18, 19 and 20 numbers. We had 48 children in the 2020 school year. Um, for winter break, but spring break was canceled on us due to the pandemic. Next slide, please. And this is just a daily schedule. It sort of talks about how when if the kids choose to go to the before and after prior to a full day, we have um, act, um, activities, free play choices for them from 730 to 9 and 4 to 530. But then in the middle of the day, we have a morning meeting. We talk about what they're going to do for the day. 9, 15 to 10, we do hands-on experience, experiences with them. We do cooking, crafts, STEM challenges, things like that. We do group games outside. We have swimming indoors. We have um, make it take it and painting. Right now we're working with um, the farmer's market and on our rainy days, we're helping to make the kindness rocks and so that they can use those um, as uh, um, supplies for the farmer's market for their rock garden. Uh, we do have lunch each day, STEM learning with guest speakers. We've had magicians out this year. We've had MSU um, bug house that came out and the Ann Arbor hands-on museum has come out and 
we are still trying to finish out the summer with a couple other speakers. This year, we are also doing our theater enrichment piece. We go to the theater from three to four every day. And the instructors that have been working with all of us express children's theater, um, explain and do activities, enrichment activities with our kids um, that are in our camp. And we still try to um, summer camp and things like that. We do weekly themes. Um, and next slide, well, I think we'll explain a little bit more about that. Julianne, I, I have a quick question. Sure. What did the bug house presentation include for the kids? That oh, they cool. had so many bugs. They, it was, it was phenomenal. And we had, they, in fact, some of our staff and some of the kids, they got to hold tarantulas and they got to, um, hold the, the, um, hold the, uh, hissing cockroaches and, they got to show how worms, um, how their worms and the bees um, do their different different activities and things like that. They they had walking sticks. They had so many displays. Yeah. It was very cool. Very cool. We're very excited to be able to be have them in our backyard to be able to do that. We've been to the Frib before. We've been to the recycling center over there. So it's been nice to have MSU over there. So our numbers for kids camp, um, we had 121 in 18, 147 in 2019. And then our 2020 summer camp was about 38 for the pandemic in our remote learning pods. Our averages was 30. And then this year um, we have 60 enrolled in our programs. And this is also broken down by resident and non-resident. Next slide, please. So as I was saying, each, theme, each summer has a theme. And in 2018, we did things that revolve around pitch. So they pitched themselves. They pitched a tent. They pitched fork to table, which you can talk, talk about. We talked about gardening and, and that kind of stuff. Um, perfect pitch. We did a music stuff and all of that. We did pitch and recycle where we went in and looked at DPW and figured out about all of that. And the kids also created their own innovative ideas and they created, um, um, they pitched an idea to the whole group on how things were going. So it was uh, very fun. And I try to be as creative as I can because I actually have been doing summer camp for 32 years. So I need to have some new, new uh, ideas. And so that's what you're seeing as I create these, uh, these different, different out of the um, box type of uh, summer plans. Next slide, please. 2019, we did a takeoff of STEM learning or STEAM learning, and we added streaming up. So we had streaming up so that we could add our perceptive parks in there. We could add resonating recreation in there. So we were taking our STEM and our six senses, and we were changing it up a little bit so that we could at least touch on the technology and the arts and all of that, but also put in our nature and our parks since we are a parks and rec department. So we got to do that with the kids, which was great. 2000, uh, whoops, sorry, yep. And then our summer for 2020, we had compassionate campers. We had wonderful wildlife, nature, nuts, magical mysteries and sensational science. And as you can see, our classrooms were all separated, big six foot tables and one kid on each side. They had to bring their own things and they had to, everything left us, left except for their art bags every day. And they'd bring it back and they were on their side of the table. And then the picture down here is of the remote learning where they're help, you know, doing their online schoolwork and we're trying to um, assist them with their homework and their activities. And um, up in the other corner, they created a big, huge maze that is actually their, that actually is, they drop marbles and they were doing velocity and trying to make predictions and trying to figure out, you know, what size marble was going to get all the way down their tracks and they had to move their tracks and everything. So that's a whole handmade um, maze system that they created themselves this school, this, uh, this year. So we were working on the math and things like that. Next slide. And then the other good thing that we happened out of 
I don't know if it's a good thing that happened out of the pandemic. However, it did open up some funding sources for us. And one was a grant with the, um, tw with, uh, the Department of, of Ed. And so I applied for that grant in partnership with the All of Us Express Children's Theater. And the money that we were awarded for this grant for this summer um, allowed us to work on those core subjects with the kids. So our staff got curriculum training. Um, some of our staff are already elementary education majors and or teachers. However, um, we did curriculum training. We learned um, some math, science, reading and writing, social emotional skill um, trainings so that we could align with the grant source. And we are trying, we were trying to bridge the summer learning loss that kids have while they are not um, in the schools. And with our coordination with All of Us Express, we would do Dynamic Dinosaurs and their um, summer camp theme for their theater was Descendants. So we were talking about the descendants of you know, dinosaurs and descendants of that while they were, you know, and with Magical Mysteries, that was our theme. And they did their play and their extra things on Harry Potter. So you can see there's a correlation. Intriguing Insects was just last week and uh, they did their performance on Beetlejuice. And this, year, this week they're doing Monster Mania uh, or they're doing Stranger Things, which looks like I missed an R in that. And uh, we were doing Monster Mania. So we have four more to go and uh, five more to go technically. And, uh, but it was been very helpful to receive the grant money to help us um, because our numbers are so low. Um, and because our ratios had to be so much smaller, um, we weren't being able to service as many children. Next slide, I think we are. And this is just a slide of everybody that we have collaborated with in a, in a, regular, a regular year. These are some of our collaborative groups that we try to have come out for our full day's care or they may pop into the before and after school programs to do activities with them. And then they also come out to our summer camps or we go to them. And that should be it. Does anybody have any other questions after you've seen that slideshow? Chuck, do you have a question? I do, well, I, Julianne, I have a couple of comments. One, you and your staff are to be commended every time I see the work that you do. It, it's a boatload of work for you and your staff to organize and manage all of this. And the programs look like fun. It looks like the kids are having a really good time. I, I come in at the, at the end of the swimming classes for kids camp when I swim at noon and I interact with the kids a little bit and watch them as they're swimming and help the kid today that got tangled up in his life jacket as he was swimming. <laughs> and it looks like great fun. I, I regret that I don't qualify for the age group or I would <laughs> So you are to be commended, Julianne. I appreciate that. Thank you. I had a question just on um, the pricing piece of it. Um, when we're talking about like the before and after care, after care, I, I saw that you've got sort of a flat registration fee and then there's a, a daily. Is that sort of like you're committed to you know, all of the days within that period? Or is it if they, cause I'm just thinking about families that maybe don't have a traditional nine to five schedule and like how that works for them. Like, are they paying for days they don't use or how does that work? Yes. So in a typical year, what happens with our before and after it's a month schedule, it's a schedule month to month. And they only need to, for our state license, you have to come at least two sessions. So that could be one morning and one afternoon. So they could just come on Mondays um, um, for both, both sessions. But because we're not a drop-in program, um, they have to be licensed for two or have to be um, signed up for two sessions a week. And we do have a lot, we have some parents that are on um, every other week schedules. So we adapt to that. And I'm changing attendance sheets every week based on if they're on or off with us. We also have those nurses that um, and um, some of the healthcare workers that will come on 
every other Friday because that's when their schedule switches. And so we are very accommodating and um, try to work with each family individually on what their needs are, but they pay for what they use um, in uh, a typical month. I think that's such a great way to do it that unfortunately we don't see enough of because, you know, my daughter's two and a half and, and one of the reasons my wife decided to stay home with her is because I work nine to five and she was working a retail schedule. So sometimes it'd be late evenings or sometimes she'd be out, you know, and she or she'd be off in the middle of the week and we wouldn't need to go. But they basically said, you're going to pay you know, this rate, no matter what you use. And so I think that to be able to plot that out a month ahead and be able to have that level of flexibility makes it all the more valuable for families who want to be able to take advantage of this when they need it, but also want that time with their kid when everybody's off, you know, and, and don't feel like they're losing something or, oh, well, we're going to take you because we, we pay for, you know, and, and so I think that's just a great way to be able to offer that level of flexibility for families that, like I said, unfortunately, we don't see enough of. I guess my comment, kudos, it makes me nostalgic for my son's time in, in, in the programs. Um, I saw in the news tonight that Lansing is offering free pre-K. And I'm wondering if there's any other funds that we might be looking at in the future, also with the new um, school budget for the state. Is there any more monies for a BNA enrichment, anything? Not as of right now. Not it hasn't trickled down to us yet. Um, it was it was um, when it all closed down in March. When it all closed down in March, we were um, able to. Uh, I was able to tap into a grant with the Fed for federal dollars that helped pay for. Um, what we lost based on returning all of our money and we still had um, rent to pay and we still had some, we had staff trainings to go through and all of those and the PPE and all of that. So the federal, we did, we're able to um, get a grant um, last uh, June, July and August in 2020 um, to pay for what we needed to upgrade for uh, before and after. Um, for that time frame. Um, and then now that we have this grant for this summer that ends September 30th, um, at least that has helped us with that grant funding. I know that the parents or some of the, well, the government has uh, issued a uh, help desk and a help, um, they've lowered their rate so more people are, shall I say, more people are eligible for state assistance now with child care. And then I also know that some families are receiving that uh, um, child care and inc uh, child uh, incentive through the end of the year. So I think that's helping families also. And I guess child my one last rate. observation is we know COVID's not on surfaces. And I understand that, that you're following guidelines that are coming down. I hope we can get guidelines better aligned with um, the reality of COVID transmission, which is not surface transmission. I, and I, I think hand hygiene is our friend anytime. That's and, right. uh, and so I'm all for all hand washing, but it's just something to think about. I see, I picture all that effort that goes into that. And then wait, we know that that's not going to be an issue of transmission. So, but, yeah, nice work. I mean, this is responding to this crisis is so above and beyond for everybody. I'm very impressed with, with the city and particularly with child care and, and being available. So some other communities just shut it down. And I know that that was a real problem for parents. And I was really impressed that you guys were able to serve a real need. And uh, nice, nice job. All these years, nice job. <laughs> All right. Anybody else um, comments, questions? I, yeah, I just have uh, one question. Um, and I, yeah, I just want to add a, a lot on the thanks here. I have two children who have been in BNA. They're both elementary schoolers now, and we love the programs and are extremely appreciative. Um, and um, I guess you mentioned the the staffing shortage and so I just you know and looking ahead to the fall and so I did just want to ask if you feel like you're getting the support you need 
going into the fall? Um, <laughs> or I mean, is there anything you think we should know in terms of what well, addressing that? Yeah, it's it's just difficult right now because a lot of our employees are MSU, LCC, all the, those students, and when they all went remote also, some of them didn't come back to campus. And so now we're hoping, well, Michigan State sort of is opening up um, more and it looks like there's gonna have more um, in-person classes. And so some of them will be returning. So that will be helpful. Um, and we, um, I always post um, our stuff on all of the education and uh, job boards and things like that. We also post um, a job posting um, through our website and stuff like that for the city. And then I tap into the staff that is returning and say, do you have any friends <laughs> that are also in education and things like that to try to get them to um, see if anybody else is interested in working with kids. But we're doing the best we can um, and uh, getting it out there uh, word of mouth. I've not ever Let's just say in the past 30 years um, of doing this kind of work, um, after I was done teaching in Okemos, I um, have never not been able to open a site because of staffing. So I'm hoping that that's going to, my trend is going to continue and that in the fall when we open, we have enough um, to be able to say, yes, we don't have a waiting list because we have enough people here to work with your kids. Um, but it has not happened yet, so I'm hoping that uh, that continues. So we're going to knock on a lot of wood, and it's going to be perfect. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I just wanted to thank you, Julianne, for um, the nature study components. It's always something I'm on the watch for, and I feel like people don't think of it as, like, at front of mind. So I'm happy to see you. Know, I've been doing it throughout, so thank you yeah. for that. Perfect. <laughs> Right. All right. Perks project updates, Wendy. And thank you very much, Julianne. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I would typically um, for a parks project update have a, a fairly detailed um, presentation for you and and I don't have that this time but I do have a few photos and I really just put them together today so I'm going to ask Justin to allow me to share my screen. And you are all set. Like he may have already done that for me. And so um, I am going to start this slideshow. Um, and we are, okay, now how do I do this? I am screen sharing. I see a screaming cockroach. <laughs> yes, I, I was, was going to end with that one, but um, hold on, I think this might, there we go. Okay, so um, some of the projects that we have going on, I have a few pictures for. The first one is the Patriot Park Pavilion and Restroom Project. Um, this project is nearing completion. We have the pavilion open and um, we had our first reservations in it last weekend. Um, tonight, we actually have our first play in the park program, which is being held in, in the pavilion at Patriarch Park. And um, it just really has been a transformation this project has. So um, we unfortunately um, don't have our metal roofs on any of the structures yet. Um, when we started this project wood was incredibly hard to come by and as we're ending it it now is metal that is very hard to come by so we have been waiting on the metal roof for quite some time but um, that that remains to be done and we're looking at that um, potentially being completed the the middle of August so we've got a couple more more weeks for that but the pavilion is is open um, the restrooms we're hoping to open this weekend and it just really is an amazing transformation. So I would encourage um, any of you to get out there if you can. We will be doing a dedication. I'm not sure exactly when that's going to be yet, possibly, um, most likely, you know, towards the end of next month at this point in time. 
Um, another project we are starting up is the new bridges that we will be installing to make connections to the Northern Tier Trail um, on Riveria Drive and Colorado Drive. We have already started clearing some of the vegetation for those projects and we're looking at construction to start probably next week. Um, we are, as, as I indicated with, with the roofing um, metal and some fabrication, um, uh, there's some fabrication backlogs and so I think where my contractor is having a little bit of trouble establishing a timeline for the uh, to receive the bridges, but there's a lot of work that could be done to prepare for when those bridges arrive. So that will um, be started here in the next week or so. Um, another project that has been ongoing for a while and we just put our final two um, components on is the White Park project. There is an overlook that um, you have an opportunity to view the vernal pool kind of down in the natural area of White Park. We just had our bench installed and the interpretive sign installed. And this interpretive sign actually was designed by a, um, a young young woman who is a student in East Lansing, and she was working towards one of her key badges as a Girl Scout in the Girl Scout program. Cool. So she designed this. She actually sat down with people from our communications department, learned how to use the graphic program. And so um, this interpretive sign talks to you about what is a vernal pool, and um, it has information about um, the young woman who helped design it as well. So also we will be looking at doing a, a dedication or ribbon cutting sometime soon. But as you can imagine, um, being down around the vernal pool right now with the mosquitoes as they are, um, you know, the, the poor staff person that I sent down there he came back and he's like I think I lost a quart of blood just getting these two pictures so um it uh that probably won't take place until you know uh, the atmosphere is is a little more um comfortable um, we did have a number of projects, a number of contracts awarded by City Council this last week for the Aquatic Center. We have a contractor lined up to do the pool shell repairs and repa replace the pool liner. We have another contractor lined up to refurbish the slides and repaint the slide towers. We have a third contractor lined up to do some work in the sand play area. We are going to convert that to a grass um, uh, lawn play area. And then we also are um, lining up contractors to do work for us um, in inside of the um, family change areas and the bathhouses. So we're making great progress on the aquatic center as well. Um, here is two projects that we have also ongoing. One is we just put sort of the final cherry on top of the Bailey Park project. We installed a final sign that acknowledges the Bailey Park donors. And so um, we are, are pleased to have that out there and formally acknowledge all those people who helped make Bailey Park a wonderful place to be. Um, then sort of an emergency project that has popped up is there is a maintenance, um, there is a maintenance building in Patriarch Park that you can see there are some holes in the roof. <laughs> we have known for some time that the roof was, was in poor condition. We didn't realize how poor condition it was. And so this actually has become an emergency project of us that we are working on right now. Um, our facility staff as well as our project staff are working together to um, we're going to have to do some remediation and completely repair this roof. So that's a project that wasn't on our list, but has risen to the top because of, um, you know, just uh, extenuating circumstances. So uh, another project that we are wrapping up, with fingers crossed, we think we have identified a solution for the shade structures over the dugouts at the softball complex. We have been struggling with this some to, to get a design that works and we think we have landed on one. So this is what the um, shade covers look like and um, we're going to be monitoring them over the rest of the, the summer 
summer and into the fall to make sure that this is a design that's going to work for us. So those were, were finally installed. Um, one final picture as you were talking about bugs in the um, summer camp program. These are some of the hissing cockroaches and um, this is actually my, my son in the black shirt. He is one of the aides this summer and uh, he's, he's really enjoying himself. I'm amazed he, he touched these bugs. He's not really a bug kind of guy, but um, these young girls were just getting right in and they picked up everything and they played with the cockroaches and the tarantulas and they had scorpions and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd watch that from a distance, I think. I'd, I'd don't think I'd, I'd play with those, but I just popped this in here listening to the conversation with Julianne. So um, what's, what's really neat about having the program at the community center as well is we really can capitalize on things at the community center. Um, the young people who participate in the program, we help facilitate getting them to swim lessons if they're interested in swim lessons or having them participate in um, the ceramics program and learning the ceramics wheels and working with the All of Us Express Children's Theater. It's a wonderful opportunity to do some sort of um, cross programming and cross promotion. And so, so that's just a, a, great, um, a great amenity, um, a great partnership. So that is all I have from a parks project standpoint, unless anybody has any questions. Wendy, how old is your son? He will be 19 next month. He just finished his first year of college. And, um, you know, this is like his, his uh, first, first big job and he's always loved kids. And so when I, I let him know that um, we needed some additional staff, he, he jumped right on it. But I'll, I'll take just a second of your time to tell you a funny story. I happened to see him at work the other day and he was playing Connect Four with a, a young boy, looked like he was maybe a second grader. And the boy is all excited. He says, I've beat him 20 games to two. And and, you know, so, and I thought that was so cute. So that night I said to my son, I said, well, Aiden, that was so nice of you to let that young boy win all those games. And Aiden says, uh, he won fair and square. I was not letting him do anything. <laughs> just laugh. He got his, you know, these, these uh, instructors kind of sometimes get their, get their fannies kicked by these young kids. Um, so he, he's enjoying himself. I've got some any other comments on the project status. I've got some questions. Do we expect the pool to be open next summer? Yes. Okay, so we're still on schedule for that. That's great. Um, yes, we are. Maintenance list. Do we have a infrastructure inventory that we could be kind of flagging stuff because so we don't get surprised necessarily, or we kind of have an idea of what, you know, like I, because it was funny because I'm like, no, we fixed everything in Patriarch now. When you run Patriarch, I'm like, no, no, it's all fixed. Like we knew the pavilion was bad for a lot that roof. You know what I mean? So I'm just, it just, I feel like we should have a most likely to fail or the kind of things that we're kind of conscious. I mean, we're doing so much repair with the, the aquatic center and that sort of thing. But anyway, just that. That sort of thing is so. So we do. We have um, the city has a capital improvements program, just an overall capital improvements program, and that relates to all all buildings and facilities in the city. It also includes streets, roads, sidewalks, etc. Um, we just had completed a inventory of all of the roofs in. Uh -huh. uh, roofs in the city system. And unfortunately, the inventory was completed after the budget was done. And so the inventory did flag this roof in Patriarch as an issue and we hadn't had a chance to incorporate it into the budget. So we do have um, roof, a roofing assessment recently completed. We also have individual building assessments. City Hall has a facility assessment, the fire station does. Um, the um, library has had a facility condition assessment. Um, Hannah Community Center needs to update theirs actually, that, that condition assessment is fairly old. And so we take all the data from those and then that sort of pulls together into 
capital improvements program. Now it's like with anything else, it's like your house, you know, you can never really predict when your refrigerator is going to fail. You know that it approximately lasts sure. year, 12 years, you know, that sort of thing. So we do our best to. Yeah. to oh, I know, I know. It's just um, and, and we work a lot with our facilities technician because he can generally tell us <laughs> this particular piece of equipment has failed three times in the past year. You know, we really need to look at replacing it, those, those type of things. So we do our best to predict. Um, the setting aside of funds for capital improvements is something that I think, you know, Tim had talked with this group numerous times that there isn't a designated funding source for capital reinvestment as it relates to parks. And I think that's similar in the rest of the facilities as well. Um, ideally, we'd be saying, you know, a a roof lasts 15 years, it costs us $100,000, therefore every year we should be setting aside $10,000 so we have that money when it fails. And, and we don't have that kind of a program anywhere in the, anywhere in the city. Um, but we do um, do our best to try and predict those capital improvements as much as we can. And one last note for Chuck. Um, the bug house has public hours normally. I'm sure pre-COVID they did. So you can Google them and you can see when you can go in and see those insects close up. It's, it's I, something. I've been, and I look forward to going back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's something. Okay, so we're ready to discuss the director hiring process. Chuck, you want to lead that? Yeah, I'm glad to jump in. Um, I, I had a couple of issues that I just wanted to um, to to have some discussion on um, the 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 times that we will have with the candidates are scheduled for Monday, and I, I wanted to ask Wendy what what is our what is the city's expectation of our role from the from the Parks and Recreation Commission. I, I had some conversations or a conversation today with Shelly Newman, our human resource director, to get a little further um, idea from her on what was envisioned for the various steps of the, the hiring process. And um, every candidate will um, have a one hour long formal interview with a panel of staff from the city. That will be myself, the city manager, um, uh, the Elaine Hardy, the DEI coordinator, Jill, our finance director, and um, our acting director of public works, Nicole McPherson. And so that will be the formal interview for the candidates, and that will be an hour long. Then each of the candidates will be given a half an hour with three different groups. Um, one of those groups will be um, two city council members. Another group will be the representative from the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission. And then a third group will be our leadership staff in our department. Now, the thought with um, the three groups that I just indicated would, that would be that these, those would be um, a little bit more of a formal interview or a formal discussion, as opposed to sort of a panel kind of situation where um, in the formal interview, we will ask every candidate the same questions. And um, we, each candidate will be given a set, of, you know, we'll, we'll have a certain amount of time to, to get through those questions. And so it's very structured and um, uniform so that all candidates can be evaluated sort of on the same scale. The idea with the other groups is that it would be a more informal setting to give people the op opportunity to interact with the candidates in a manner that they might typically interact with them and to ask questions that are um, more important or um, group specific. So for the staff, they might ask things like, well, what is your management style? What would you expect from your staff? Um, you know, those sorts of questions. As a um, commission, 
you may want to think about what types of things are most important to you, or you may just want to talk with each individual candidate and see how they interact with you. Um, on Friday, you should receive an email that includes information on each one of the candidates. So you'll have their application, their name, their background, etc. When you come in on, my, and that information on Friday will also give you information about where you're going to park, where you're going to go, what the, the schedule looks like, that sort of thing. Then um, you'll have a written um, feedback form to complete, which will be provided to the city manager, and that will be then considered as he's, he's you know, reviewing um, the various recommendations. So that's what the vision is. Now, if you, there is something different that you would like to see, I have no problem with bringing that back and making some suggestions, but that's sort of the vision at this point in time with how people saw this process um, evolving. So each candidate is going to go through two and a half to three hours of you know, this intensive interview process through those various groups. Is the feedback form from the commission or do each of us do a feedback form that are um, that are participating in this? Um, my um, understanding is that it's each individual as opposed to the group. Um, that's how we typically do it when we, we hire people. We each fill out our own, you know, evaluation. And then, um, you know, whoever is making the decision will discuss, review those and, and discuss the strengths and weaknesses of each candidate in, right. make, in making their decision. Will there be an opportunity for the three of us after, they, after we've talked to the candidates to talk amongst ourselves before we, we do the, the evaluation form? That, um, you mean in between candidates or once you've spoken to all four candidates? Or at any time, I, I'm not. I, okay. Um, I think that's definitely something that um, can be ensured. I don't know that with the schedule, it could happen in between candidates. Right. But we what, can make that happen. There's whatever room you, yeah, that. whatever room you are in, if you would like to stay in that room for a while after you've had the interviews and and discuss and and sort of um, talk amongst yourselves, that that is is can be arranged. Yes, and that's part of the point of not being a quorum that it isn't an official meeting that we it really can be freely mm -hmm. discussed. Right. Yes, I, I like those arrangements, Wendy. You, you've addressed my questions, and, and uh, I didn't want this to just be a meet and greet. I wanted it to be meaningful and to have a chance to to give our feedback. And it sounds like we will, and to discuss it amongst ourselves. Yeah, I, I like that too, Chuck, very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that was a real concern of the staff as well. And um, they asked some of the the same questions, and um, it's. Um, you, you will be able to influence the um, discussion and the selection. This isn't something that is George decides and everybody else has to sort of deal. You know, it's, it's something that you will have the opportunity to influence that um, selection. I, I'm glad to hear that. Um, we'll, we'll not only be able to give them feedback, but they will take it seriously and take it into consideration in the process. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. And Adam, how does that sound? Talk. I think that sounds really good. Like you said, it, it allows us to, like you said, I, more than just to meet and greet, the ability to really be able to listen in, analyze the candidates and provide meaningful feedback that is going to play a role in who we ultimately select. I think that that's, that's a role that the commission wants to and should be playing when it comes to um, the selection of a new director. So all of that sounds very good to me and I'll be excited to meet you guys in person as well. So. Yeah, yeah, then there's that, Adam. Me and Chuck, we've seen each other. Yeah, you yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Adam, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person too. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. It should be, uh, you know, it, it's, 
with this and other jobs I've had, it's just been so crazy to, to interact with people for so long and, and have never met, and met them. Yeah. So um, no, it'll be exciting. And then, and like you said, I think that those arrangements work for, for me and for us um, in terms of what we want our role to be in the selection process. So. Right. And I guess my, my observation at this point is that I am concerned that the city does not have an intentional diversity and inclusion hiring process in terms of making sure they're posting jobs where assorted people will see them. And, and maybe, and what, see, I lived through all that, what we had at the university, then HR reviews all the applications and so kicking kicking applicants out, like, so we, we're not even seeing that. That's something that you, people, you kind of want eyes on. HR, I'm not saying that's the area I, we have eyes on it, but you don't want to see people, that's where you see people excluded by race and gender. That's why you see people who seem to have very valid applications. Well, why didn't this person get through the interview process? And so... I'm not saying any of that happened, but I would love to see processes, the city implement HR processes that make sure that that moves forward, that are some checks and balances to, to getting candidates, diverse candidates in and being able to interview them. So I just think those are the kind of things like when you can say, oh, we publish all job postings in these locations. And I hope the diversity and inclusion director is is looking at that sort of thing and changing those sorts of processes and procedures. That's that's where you make real change. And and I, you know, I'd like to, I'd like, I wish that, I wish that the city was right on top of answering that question and ready with answers like, oh yes, we're posting at national and state parks and rec, but we're also looking at black park administrative um, groups and if you know just having that be a part of the HR job. And, and like I said, the university, I went through the whole transition with them and they, you know, it got, so you could, you, if you've got to say why you're not interviewing somebody, if they meet the qualifications posted and that sort of thing. And it just sets up a conscientiousness that I think is really useful. So, so just something to think about. So that, that last, meeting when you're saying like, oh, I don't know if I necessarily need to be on it, but I would like to make sure like certain questions are asked. Or is that something you all are like, is that we're, we're going to talk about a bit tonight or would it sure, be good yeah, for me yeah. to like write something out or, you it's know, because like. opportunity to talk about it or you can send <laughs> me, I said what, me or Chuck or Jeff or Adam or anything anybody wants to share. And wants yeah. to make sure we ask yeah. and that sort of thing, definitely. And I mean, certainly, y'all know, you know, what <laughs> if I, uh, you know, the, the the point of view that I want to make sure that they have, because um, you know, Tim was so open to uh rest restoration of habitat and the opportunity for that, yeah, and really going forward with all. um, you know, the importance of this being a pollinator friendly community, but also like you know, sort of um, like uh nature is really uh, uh, the key part of if we're gonna have a chance with this climate emergency. I'm calling it climate emergency. It's beyond change. We are lucky here. We don't know how long that's gonna last. We're lucky here, you know what I mean? So I, I really would hope that, um, you know, and I, I'd be happy to help come up with a question. Um, that, that might, you know, sort of cover that, but just to get a sense if they already have that in mind, if they have a sense of like, oh, you know, the parks and the green spaces are such an opportunity, such an important part of how we're going to respond to this, because we see how quickly things can happen. And, like, you know, if we can have a sense of like, we're getting ahead of it, we're planning it now, this is like part of what we're doing in a really conscious way it'd be really great to have the person already of that mind. Any other comments, suggestions? But that's open. Please send Chuck, me or Adam any questions or concerns that you, you know, and, and now are we only gonna see the, are we the only ones who are gonna receive the list of candidates? The, 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 is that something that's going to be shared with the whole commission? 
Um, on, on Friday, that information will go to those who are participating in the interview process. Okay. Um, I don't know at this point in time how broadly public those right. are being distributed, um, but at some point in time, it will be become public knowledge. Right. I'm just not sure. Right. I just wondered if people are going to have a chance to see the names before if they, uh, I don't know, would know somebody or have some personal mm -hmm. view of an individual. But yeah, you know, we'd be find out if it's something that we need that it needs to just be with and then would Sarah be included as the alternate? <laughs> if for some reason I cannot fulfill my duties, <laughs> that's Miss America. <laughs> Well, I, I would make an assumption that the city would at some point have a process where they, they would release the, the candidate list and the decision and that that's, that's not our role in the, in the Parks and Recreation Commission, our role. Right, but my, my concern, Chuck, is that people would be able to weigh in, give us feedback to share when we're meeting with the candidates. That, that, was, that was my concern about, that's why I'm asking that question now. And and you're you're just thinking in terms of the commission at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, just in terms of the commission as we invite everyone to to give us their questions for the candidates. I just wondered what level of information they were gonna have. I I can find out what um the candidate what the candidates have been told. Um because yeah, if yeah, it's, told it will remain confidential. That's sure. That's different than if they've been told the information will be shared once you reach a, a certain, you know, a certain sure. position. So I'll, I'll find that out. Okay. Any other? Um, oh. Pam, Pam, this is Jane. I, oh, I just Jane, wanted I to share. <laughs> yes, I know. I, for some reason, my camera's not working, but I just want to know that the most important part of this whole process is that you make sure you tell the candidates how crucial and important his assistant is. Her oh, assistant. assistant is? <laughs> ah, yes. Well, Jane, I think that's, no, well, that's, you know, that, that's a good question. I wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase, I wouldn't be telling them. I'd be kind of asking them. And if they aren't aware of it, then that's a red flag, right? Like that's, that's, a, that's an awesome point, Jane. I'd rather set them up a little bit and see if yeah. they're, you know, will acknowledge that. Yeah. We could ask them, do you think that the assistant needs a 1% raise, 3% <laughs> raise. But, exactly. <laughs> I just I just had to lighten the mood there a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> Could you tell me the official title of this role again that's being interviewed for? It's the Director of Parks and Recreation. All right, I just had it flipped around. No. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we got sent the job description quite a few months ago, but I can resend that too. I was just looking at it. Okay, so staff communication slash director's report. Okay, I don't have um, a, a whole lot at this point in time. I did want to remind everybody, though, that um, according to your schedule, there is no August um, park. Ad Rec Advisory Commission meeting. That's a little bit of a summer hiatus. Um, we do not have anything at the staff level that would warrant any need for a special meeting. So provided you as a commission are still comfortable with taking August off, there is no, there's no reason from, from our standpoint to change that schedule. Um, I do wanna share with everybody that in September um, will be your first time back to in-person meetings. Um, City Council has um, indicated that it's the expectation that beginning in August, um, uh, councils and boards will begin meeting in person. And so um, we will be back to meeting at the Hannah Community Center. Um, it's up on the second floor and we'll make sure you have the exact room number. Um, it's basically not the large room at the end of the hall, but um, the room just to the, to the right of that. Um, so you can, can look forward to, to seeing everybody in person in September. Um, and that's really all I have. 
other than the, the various communications. So I will work through those as well, sorry. Um, you have in your packet a flyer that talks about um, Mondays in the Parks, which is uh, the program that the East Lansing Public Library is running. They are bringing their mobile library out into uh, an assortment of the city's parks. And um, the idea is to bring the library and library books to the community. Anything that you could do at the library, you can do uh, in this mobile library. It's a mobile hotspot. Um, you can check out books, you can order books, you can return books, um, you can um, get a library card. So anything that you can do in the library, you can do through this um, mobile library as well. So I would encourage you if your schedules allow to visit um, the mobile library during one of these times. You also received information in your packet um, that is a survey that we received from the Ingham County Parks Department. They are going through a process of updating their five-year park plan, and so they're looking for feedback from people. Um, so please feel free to take the survey, pass it on to your friends, um, you know, post it on your social media sites. They're really trying to get the word out and get as much feedback as they can. You also received an, uh, a link to a Lansing State Journal article in which um, there is information about restoration of an art piece called L5. It used to be in the parking lot, which is now um, the Target building. Um, for That's how I refer to that building. I think it's Center City. Um, and so the sculpture had to be moved. It will be restored. And the goal right now is installation in White Park, actually. We were looking at, at the curve where Lake Lansing Road curves, kind of. Uh, the original plan was to do a trailhead there with a small welcome plaza and a sign that had to be um, changed due to budget constraints. But we're looking at installing this sculpture there as sort of a, a you know, welcome to East Lansing, a, a visual indication that you're coming into the city. And then the final communication that you received is um, to, uh, 2021 Outdoor Participation Trends Report. This came from the Outdoor Foundation. And I actually have used information from this report before in the Park and Rec, the five-year um, Park Recreation Open Space and Greenways Plan, as well as in some grants that, that I have submitted. So a, a lot of just, I, I love data. I think it's just fascinating to, to see trends and charts and numbers. Um, so I think there's a lot of cool stuff in here. But, um, you know, not surprisingly, a, a big uptick in um, outdoor participation over the course of the pandemic, which is wonderful to see. Hopefully that continues. Um, and, you know, they break participation down by, by trends, nationality, you know, gender, age those sorts of things, um, the type of activity you're doing. So um, if you have some time, look through that. There's some great data in there. And that is all I have. Wendy, I left on my Zoom invites, but I didn't see a packet. Was it a separate mailing, a separate email that had that in there? Well, click on the links. If you click on the links, Nicole, the document will come up. Oh, so click on links. And, and is it is it part of the Zoom invite email? Yeah, is it yes. If you go to the agenda in the link, and you can just click right. on anything in blue and it pops up, the document pops up. Okay, I must have just been looking for like, I think I was just looking in the wrong spot. I was just looking for like the well, yeah, bottom the attachments. There, there's just a link to them. Okay. That makes you, sense. That's why I didn't see also, it. <laughs> yeah, you also should receive, generally the Friday before the meeting, you should receive an email from Jane. And Jane indicates on there, you know, just reminds you of the meeting and gives you a link directly to I'll look for the Jane email. Yeah, then. Thank yeah you. it's in the Jane email where you get the right. link and you end up on the agenda. And But now that we're talking about that, thank you, Nicole, because I noticed we do not have the slides for the school age program. Uh, so that would be nice to get a copy of those or include that has, that's been added. Oh, perfect. There you go. So now that's there. there. See, you go back, can back you go up there. It should be there. Like it wasn't there, but now it's there. So yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. That's yeah. perfect. Um, yes. Excellent. 
And, and that's kind of a little bit of, of not a little bit, that's, um, that's my fault that that wasn't posted on Friday. I, I at, asked Julianne to let me review it over the weekend. And so um, I apologize for the late ad of that. Hey, it's there now. <laughs> he had it done in time. I did not have my review done in time, so. <laughs> and I just, I just found it all on the link from when I just looked up Jane, so. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other comments on Wendy's updates about being back in person? I'm personally a little concerned about this Delta variant. I We're almost at 3% positive rate in Michigan now, and knock on wood, you know, we'll see. We'll see, knock on wood, we're, you know. So, um, Commissioner, are we ready for Commissioner Communication? Does anybody have any previous comments for? All right, Adam, do you have some Commissioner comments? I have any commissioner comments this evening, but thank you. Sarah Hoover, do you have any commissioner comments? Um, I just need it noted that I will not be available for the October meeting, so I will not be in town or anywhere. October, so far away. It's fall. It's uh, fingers crossed. Appreciate the heads up. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Chuck? Nothing else. Thank you. Nicole? Let me talk about Ingham County. That's exciting. I'll definitely take that survey, but I um, had a little interview with their environmental commission. They're starting one up again. So that's Excellent. nice. Yeah, yeah. So they'll, they'll let us know uh, next week. But uh, yeah, I just told stories. So maybe hopefully they like that. No, They've got quite a bit of budget. They've got quite a bit of budget. So. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they, they perked out too when I said I was on this um, commission. So that's Excellent. cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, keep us posted. Sarah Redfield? None, thanks. Okay, and I don't have any, but I am gonna be sending everybody this interesting Bloomberg article on teen girls. Teen girls need better places and public spaces to hang out. And I had not ever thought about that. And it's, it's a great article and there's some interesting ideas that people have done because they mentioned basketball courts, skate parks, Many of the kind of teen activity areas do not have now two things. They don't have a lot of girl participation with, I wish they had more and they'd be encouraged, but there is also maybe they want different things. So it's, it's a really neat article, touches on stuff that I had not thought about. So I'll throw that out to everybody and have that added to the minutes for next time because it's a big group communication. I saw that oh. article actually. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a tween girl who yeah, uses see? The Albert Avenue space as if it's a parkour course. Right on. <laughs> see? Well, okay, maybe you don't think, but yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, all right. If no one has anything else, so someone move to. Oh, I could have put it in the chat. Some, that, that's I didn't even think about that. I sent it as an email. That's that's great. Um. Does anyone want to move to close this meeting? So moved. Second. I second. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank Summer you. Summer all. Summer Thank off. You. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You're here. You're August off. Have fun. <laughs> so, so goodbye. Yes.